All righty. So hello, Neptune customers. Welcome to another Friday interview. This week, we have the pleasure of speaking not to a, you know, brand ambassador or factory owner, but someone that works for PCA. So if you guys don't know, PCA stands for Premium Cigar Association, and we're going to be interviewing Joshua. Forgive me if I say your last name wrong. Obersky? Correct. I love it. So you're the head <laughs> of government affairs at PCA, correct? That is correct. And as the head of government affairs for the Premium Cigar Association, could you t explain to us what exactly is the PCA? Absolutely. And, and thank you, first and foremost, for having me on the program. I'm a big fan of Neptune and I had the uh, opportunity to visit with Luz, who is on the board of directors of PCA. Um, you know, as the Premium Cigar Association, we're the leading advocacy uh, force fighting for premium cigar retailers, uh, brick and mortar shops, lounges, uh, 3,500 across the country. Uh, as well as the 300 manufacturers and consumers uh, that enjoy premium cigars and pipe tobacco. And I serve as our head of government affairs, which is essentially the chief lobbyist, um, you know, representing us with the Food and Drug Administration, uh, as well as Congress and the state legislatures. So anytime there's a smoking ban that comes up or, uh, for instance, in Florida, uh, where I know Neptune is based, uh, the uh, prohibitions of smoking in public parks and public beaches, that's something that we uh, push back on. Uh, we provide a lot of economic data, small business data, as well as health data to kind of combat the misconceptions about premium cigars. So I think in a nutshell, I educate lawmakers and regulators about the nuances and the specifics about premium cigar and premium cigar policy. That's amazing. And actually, as a consumer, that's something that I never thought about in general, just uh, how you said that in Florida, we have that ban now going on in like public parks and things like that. I remember I was smoking a cigar with a friend at a park. We were far away in a little gazebo doing nothing illegal, just smoking our cigars, having a barbecue, and they told us to put them out. And I was like, sure, but why? <laughs> yeah. And, and it is interesting because you see a lot of that in the localities. Fortunately, we've been able to stave that off at the state state level. I know, like, you know, for instance, I, I'm first and foremost a consumer. I, ha I have the job of working for PCA, but I got into this, you know, three years ago working as a lobbyist for other associations, but as, uh, you know, somebody that really enjoyed premium cigars and that was my passion. So that's what we're fighting for is the ability to enjoy a cigar uh, without all these restrictions that other mass market product, the cigar community. I think that that is one of the benefits of, of working in this industry is that you feel good about protecting this because every cigar lounge that I go to and, you know, we're able to roll back taxes or, or defeat a smoking ban. Um, everybody realizes that victory and, you know, enjoying cigars it's not in the advocacy side it's not always top of mind but when you're facing the heat of a regulator or or a legislator that's coming after cigars then you really need to be involved and that's why we're setting up education programs you know websites social media and doing interviews like this to tell folks this is how you can get involved this is how you can uh, you know help in the fight to preserve the passion that we all enjoy. Yeah, not only the passion, the right to, you know, the right to party, the right to enjoy your cigar. <laughs> Absolutely. So Joshua, what can you tell us about your position over at PCA? So what does like a regular day look like for you? Yeah, it's, I mean, it is crazy. Our, our schedule is, is really busy right now. We're in the midst of st state legislative sessions. So um, I've tracked over 1500 bills um, in the different states. We've activated on about 50 of them. Uh, but, you know, a lot of it, I mentioned that education component. I'm our, um, because we're going to shop to shop, meeting with owners, asking them. I was just in Delaware and Pennsylvania, and I asked the shop owners, you know, what is keeping you up at night? What is government? 
doing that's causing problems for you. And obviously with a lot of the COVID closures and the COVID measures, we want to make sure that these small businesses and these jobs are able to rebound, but continue to grow and thrive. There's 30,000 retail employees across the country. And that's who I'm trying to protect every day. And um, so, you know, events are, are a piece of it. Um, and then actually meeting with lawmakers, meeting with coalition partners. So before this call, I got off a, a, a conference call with the Maryland Association, all of their retailers, their lob state lobbyists, trying to strategize for three state bills and then two local ordinances. Um, so it varies a lot. I mean, I last year, the FDA and a lot of the stuff that was going on there, I had 12 visits to the White House, uh, three visits to the Food and Drug Administration's headquarters. And um, we did 300 congressional meetings. So our, our office, PCA's office is right near Union Station, literally steps from where all the senators and, and House of Representatives are based. So um, a lot of times walking the halls, going from meeting to meeting, telling people this is what a premium cigar is, this is what we're not, and, and, and these are the, the problems and issues that we're facing. So when you guys go to different states, um, do you meet with the lawmakers there and attorneys there, or do you kind of go into these different states kind of knowing a little bit about the law in that state, um, you know, before going to meet all the retailers? Yeah, so we, we certainly research. We're tracking uh, bills in all 50 states. So we have a service that, you know, I'm, I, every morning I'm looking at 50, 60 bills that are coming up and then I'll flag them. I'm fortunate to work with uh, Ryan Parada, who's our, our research associate, and Glenn Luke, who's our state affairs advisor. And we kind of triage the issues. And, you know, this week, um, just today, we released a, an action alert that came out that, um, you know, they want to increase the OTP tax in Indiana. So we're opposing that because that will lead to, to lost revenue for the state overall, but it, it, it impacts the retailer negatively. Prices will be higher for cigars, and we want to keep that so that they're affordable, so that you, know, you can enjoy a cigar from any socioeconomic class or, or background. Um, and on Monday, had a set up a meeting with all the Michigan uh, retailers and their president of their state association with the Secretary in Health and Human Services and her staff for the state about reopening the, the lounges. And, you know, that, was, that work was featured in Cigar Aficionado. We're trying to uh, come to a consensus. We're getting all the data and information that they've requested. Uh, but again, Andy Hyde, who uh, owns Nolan's Tobacco Shop in, in Michigan, he was the feature of that meeting. It wasn't about me as, as a hired staff. Okay, yeah, because I, I'm thinking, like you said about Indiana and how the state wanted to increase that OTP tax, that would not only hurt the, the, the retailer as a brick and mortar, because people in Indiana might be like, you know, screw this, I'm just going to buy online. But it, it also affects all of the consumers in that state, because yeah. they're not going to want to pay that extra money. And in the end, it's just cigar smokers all across the board, whether you just enjoy to smoke or whether you have your own shop. It hurts everybody just the same. Yeah, and you'll see people, you know, what we tell folks is your neighbor, your neighboring states, people are going to go and buy their cigars there. It's not that far in, in Indiana go to, to go to Michigan or Ohio, Ohio or, um, you know, any of the other states. And um, that's, we want to keep the tax base, the tax dollars local. And you know, supply, but keep and, and affordable. And that's that's really what we're working to do to keep all three pieces. I, I like to think of the cigar industry as a spoke on a wheel: the manufacturer, the retailer, and consumer. And they all have to be going in the same direction if we're going to be successful from an advocacy perspective. Of course, it kind of all has to work together. So what, yeah. other than states raising taxes, um, what are some of the other problems that brick and mortar retailers face today? Yeah, I think, you know, on the positive side, we're working in uh, four or five states right now uh, to actually allow 
allow alcohol sales with premium cigar. So basically creating a licensing, licensing uh, uh, regime for cigar bars. So in a lot of states, you cannot sell liquor um, with cigars. And um, in North Dakota, I think that's the, uh, a state where we have a really good chance of passing that legislation. Um, you know, cigars and spirits go hand in hand. And uh, we want to afford people the opportunity to enjoy those and also provide, you know, additional business opportunities, you know, despite COVID and, and a lot of the restrictions in, in, in many of the states last year, we had a net positive of more cigar retail stores and lounges opening up than closed. So I think that that's an important statistic that we want to continue. We want this industry to grow and have, um, you know, adults to have the ability to purchase adult products of course of course and when was it that the age changed to 21 it was uh just last a couple december. years ago uh, yeah just uh la last december uh, not this you know past december but two decembers ago and um you know that was a, a federal requirement that went from 18 to 21 some of the states are still um updating their codes their state codes to um you know go to, to 21 but it's it's been interesting you get rumors in suffolk county new york they introduced the ordinance that would raise the age of purchase to 25 we've heard rumors what? that people want to go as as far as 27 so that's that's an area where we have to uh, fight back on, um, you know, with, with T21, we weren't as involved as, as some of the other tobacco groups, just because premium cigar enthusiasts, the average person has their first premium cigar at the age of 30. Um, so mm -hmm. it is an adult product and we were working to get rid of the substantial equivalence requirements and, uh, some of the pre-market testing. And one of our, um, you know, arguments that we would posit to the FDA was that we don't have a youth access issue. Um, so it was kind of threading the needle between those issues. But I think we were able to do that successfully, um, you know, obviously in the courts with the SE rule and, um, you know, the labeling requirements, we successfully defeated the FDA in both of those last year, which were monumental victories. But, you know, I can tell you this, we are going to fight tooth and nail every step of the way for any other age increases that that come about we set up a, a site for consumers and and retailers alike called cigaraction.org and folks can go on there and see what's going on in their state so any important issue um, at the, the state and the federal level, they'll be in the action alert section. So for the folks listening in in the, the Neptune um, base in, in Florida, the one that I mentioned about the state level uh, park prohibitions and, and, and um, this prohibition, that alert is on there. You can take 30 seconds and send a letter to your elected officials opposing that. Um, it also has our policy statements and how you can get involved uh, as a consumer retailer and manufacturer with PCA. Um, and, and, and actually, I've had folks that, you know, um, two years ago or a year and a half ago when I was getting started, went to cigar action they started tweeting or, or posting on facebook or instagram our alerts and are now at the point where they're meeting face to face with elected officials so it's nice to see folks get more and more involved as they learn the process government can be very intimidating as you know you go to a, a you know congress or a state legislature and you see the marble uh, floors and the statues and and the history that's there but you all have a voice in this and you all have the ability to fight for what you believe in. Of course. And as cigar smokers, I mean, people cannot bother complaining if their favorite stores and lounges close down, if they're not willing to take action and advocate for this habit that becomes like, it's more than an interest for some people. It's like your livelihood or, you know, people have podcasts, people have like review sites and people really get into cigars. Like this is a whole community of people that love to smoke and love to talk to other people about cigars so you cannot 
sit there and be mad and be on Twitter like, oh man, this lounge closed down. If you're not willing to just do a 30 second survey or send a, you know, if it takes only a minute, send that letter over to a, you know, a local Congress person or anybody, uh, even at a state level that can just help out or at least have you yeah. have your complaint be heard. And I wanted to ask you because you gave us the examples of, yeah. of um, Indiana and of Florida. So what in, in your experience right now, it's only March. So out of all of the you know ordinances that you've seen so far going on in March, what has been the most dramatic on a state level that affects not only retailers, but consumers mainly? Nicotine cessation products, so like Nicorette patches, they wanted to require retailers to sell those. And as what? you know, that's for cigarettes. That is not for premium cigars or pipe tobacco. And, and we said, you know, we had to bring all the, um, you know, health studies together and, and say that, you know, this, this is not for this product. Premium cigars are not addictive. Um, you know, your average consumer has, uh, has less than two cigars a month. So, you know, you're going to require a retailer uh, to buy something that will have no effect on their consumer base. Definitely. And then it come, becomes a question also of who are going to be who's going to be many like manufacturing or distributing these patches. And is it going to be something government controlled? And it becomes a whole nother thing. But on top of that, I remember I spoke to someone, an attorney, and he worked for um, it was tobacco, but definitely cigarettes. And I think he worked like on the FDA side. Uh, so other guys, the bad guys, no, I'm playing. <laughs> so he was joking and he was explaining to me. He said, look, this is the best way I can describe the differences be between cigarettes and cigars. Um, you'll see a person smoking a cigarette outside in the rain because they just need to get like the nicotine fix. And you will not see a person smoking a cigar in the rain because they need to be in a very comfortable place. They need to have the right tools to cut the cigar, to light the cigar. And they don't want anything to interfere with their enjoyment of the cigar. Whether, whereas if it's raining, you know, someone's just like, let me just smoke the cigarette really quick. And you won't see a person smoking a cigar out in the rain really quick. Have 200 people will touch the cigar before it goes to the consumer. And I was fortunate enough in, in, in January to go to Nicaragua, to Esteli and Managua and Jalapa and Pueblo Novo and um, um, Granada. And that was uh, just an eye-opening experience to see the fermenting barns, the factories, the hanging barns. And, and I, I will stick to my day job. I tried rolling cigars. Um, but, you know, you really, having that experience, you get to see how it all comes together. And it ha makes me tell the story and present the story of premium cigars in an easier way. There are, you know, 200,000 people in Latin America, you know, outside of the U.S. You know, I focus on U.S. policy here, but outside of the U.S. that depend on um, this industry. And it, I mean, that in, in Esteli, that is the main driver of the economy. And mm -hmm. you see the improvements and I, I've walked with uh, a manufacturer that has suspended Luciano from uh, Ace Prime cigars. Mm -hmm. um, and and he took me to curb because of the cigar industry. And he was like, you know, that used to be, there was no road there. Now we have a road there. That was nothing. Now there's a clinic. Now there's a um, childcare center. So that um, is, is really interesting and a positive development. All the, just think about the charitable work that the cigar industry goes does i don't know of any golf tournament or um you know of a charity auction where there isn't a box of cigars there and um to me that that's important to showcase that side of the story in addition to all of the policy side so you know when i meet with elected officials i tell that story um that it's not all about dollars and cents and employees that's important but there's a lot of added secondary and tertiary benefits of the premium cigar industry. Of course. And that's actually a beautiful way to put it. Um, kind of seeing firsthand all of the improvements that kind of indirectly consumers have helped create because they're the driving force for all of these cigars being manufactured, distributed, uh, sitting on the shelves at uh, retail locations. 
So it's really cool to see how this enjoyment of cigars has created better lives in other countries as well. Absolutely. And I wanted to ask you one last question, Joshua, before you go. So how would you encourage cigar smokers to advocate for retailers and manufacturers of this industry? Um, if someone wanted to advocate, like what are the steps that they could take to advocate on both state and federal levels? Where Absolutely. would they start? So I mentioned Cigar Action, www.cigaraction.org. Um, that's our grassroots portal. You can sign up to receive uh, our email alerts. It's entirely free. And, um, you know, we'll alert you of what things are going on at the federal and state level. Um, we have a running list of all of the priority uh, states and, and activities that are going on right now. So you can browse through that. Our main website, www.premiumcigars.org, also has information and resources about some of the activities that we've done. So if you know, you're know you in the retail community, uh, a lot of the stuff about sanitation for COVID or tax benefits or PPE or PPP, we produced all of that information that's available there. Um, I, I would also say, simply put, continue to support your brick and mortar retailers continue to support your tobacconists um you know like Luz does an incredible job at, at neptune and um you know continue to support her and the, the community there um because it we're very fortunate to have shops like that in in, in florida um, fighting the good fight, you know, working on the advocacy side, but providing that sense of community, that sense of camaraderie. Um, I mean, I was astonished and, and grateful uh, for, for when I had the opportunity to visit Neptune and see the product selection there. And I got stuff and I, I took stuff uh, home with me that I couldn't find anywhere else. So as, as a consumer, I have to give uh, a, a shameless plug there because I, I am a big fan of all of our um, our, mem our PCA members and tobacconists across the country. But all righty, Joshua, thank you so much for joining Absolutely. us. We'll definitely be thank contacting you, you later on in the year. Of course. And I hope you have a good one. Okay. Thank you so much.